Section 7.4, Integration by Trigonometric Substitution. So this section describes a certain special technique for integrating functions of a particular form, functions that contain either something that looks like square root of a squared minus u squared, square root of u squared minus a squared, or square root u squared plus a squared. And you'll see here in a while that the integrand can come in many, many strange forms. But this technique will apply if the integrand contains a square root of one of these three forms. So one thing you should be noticing right away is that we've seen all three of these before. If I think about that first one, of course we know that when we anti-differentiate the square root of a squared minus u squared in a denominator like that, that we get the sine inverse of u over a. Similarly, if we take the antiderivative of u times the square root u squared minus a squared, we get 1 over a secant inverse absolute value u over a. And we know famously that if we take the antiderivative of u squared plus a squared in a denominator, we get 1 over a tan inverse u over a. Okay, so we've seen these recently back in section 6.9. So it shouldn't surprise you once we get rolling here with the technique that my approach to integrating any kind of function that contains this square root, square root of a squared minus u squared, should somehow involve sine. And similarly, it's going to turn out that this technique is going to involve using secant if my integrand contains something that looks like a square root of u squared minus a squared. And then lastly, if my integrand contains a square root of the sum of those two, u squared and a squared, my substitution is going to involve a tangent. Okay, so we'll see how that works now because we're going to go through each of these in turn. And let's start with the first one, which would be how to integrate things that contain square root a squared minus u squared. Once you get the idea of that technique, you'll see that when we do it for the other two cases, it's really the same kind of technique. There's just a slightly different substitution for each of these three different cases. But once you've got the general idea of the technique, it applies to all three cases. So. Let's look at our first case, which would be forms containing square root a squared minus u squared. So let's make a substitution. Let's let u equal a sine theta. So we'll do an example here in a minute, but we're saying if your integrand contains a square root of a squared minus u squared. Let's make the substitution u equals a sine theta. Okay, if we do that, of course, notice right away that du becomes a cosine theta d theta. Now, one other thing that's going to come up here in a while is that we're most likely going to have to use sine inverse. We know to use the inverse sine function that this sine function has to be restricted on its domain so that it's one to one. Okay, what was that domain restriction? Well, you recall for the sine function, it was negative pi over two to pi over two. Meaning, for the sine function to be one to one, my theta angle has to be in quadrant one or quadrant four. Meaning the theta in this substitution is either an angle in quadrant one or it's that same angle but negative, meaning it's in quadrant four. All right, notice with the substitution that we're saying sine theta equals u over a. Of course, u over a, that would be opposite over hypotenuse, which means for each of those angles, it would be u and a, it would be u and a. 
notice in the picture that if u is positive, that puts us in quadrant 1. If u is negative, that puts us in quadrant 4. So those are the two places we could land depending on the sign of u. Lastly, before we proceed, notice the other thing that this tells you. It tells you that theta equals sine inverse of u over a. All right, now let's proceed with figuring out what the substitution does to this form. So look at square root a squared minus u squared. Well, that would be square root a squared minus a squared sine squared because that's how we defined u. That would be square root a squared 1 minus sine squared theta. Uh, we're going to restrict a or assume that a is positive. Remember that a squared term is positive, so we'll just assume that the square root of a squared is also positive. So a we'll assume is positive, which means the square root of a squared is just a, which leaves 1 minus sine squared theta under that square root. Of course, I know that that's just sine squared theta or cosine squared theta. Okay, here's the beauty of this substitution in that it fits very nicely with how we've restricted these trig functions to make our inverse trig functions. Notice where we've restricted theta to for the sine function, for there to be a sine inverse function. We've restricted ourselves to quadrants one and quadrant, quadrant one and quadrant four. Well, notice in quadrant one and quadrant four, cosine is positive in both quadrants. If cosine is positive, then the square root of cosine squared is simply cosine. I don't have to worry about whether cosine is positive or negative. It is positive in both quadrants. Okay, so the big upshot here is when I have a form a squared minus u squared square root and I make the substitution u equals a sine theta, this substitution will turn that square root a squared minus u squared into a cosine theta. In other words, I have taken a fairly nasty two-term difference of squares under a square root and turned it into a simple multiple of a cosine function. That's what this substitution does. It transforms a fairly nasty square root into a simple trig function. All right, let's see it in action with an example. So pretty typical example. Uh, let's say we have the integral of square root 9 minus x squared over x squared. Okay, immediately I spot the square root of 9 minus x squared in the numerator, and I know that looks like an a squared minus a u squared, where I'm treating the a as a 3 and the u as an x. So I know the substitution I should use is x equals 3 sine theta. That implies dx is 3 cosine theta d theta. Let's draw our reference triangle picture as long as we're at it. So if x equals 3 sine theta, then we know we're in quadrant 1 or in quadrant 4. This, of course, says that sine theta is equal to x over 3. Well, that means if this is the theta, then that's x and that's 3. If this is the theta, then this is x and this is 3. In either case, the adjacent side is the same value because that side is shared by both triangles. So if I just looked at, let's say, the top reference triangle, the one from quadrant 1, so there's theta, there's x, there's 3, that third side is actually the a squared minus u squared that we started out with. Okay, so let's keep that picture in mind. We'll need that shortly. Now we just go back to our integral and we start rewriting it. So of course, first we have 9 minus x squared. Now, 
once we get used to the, the trick here, we don't really need to write this out every time, but I'm going to on these first few examples. I know 9 minus x squared will be 9 minus 3 sines of theta squared, which would be 9 sine squared theta, over x squared, which would be 9 sine squared theta. Now, here's something that sometimes people forget about. Uh, it's very easy, trust me, to forget about the dx. But the dx is actually sometimes quite a large expression. In this case, it's just 3 cosine theta. Can't forget about that. Okay, there's what my integral looks like now that I've substituted everything. Now, of course, when I clean up that square root in the top, I know that becomes 3 cosine theta. And, of course, when I put that together with the other 3 cosine theta, that gives me a numerator of 9 cosine squared theta. So I think what we end up with is integral cotangent squared theta. How do I integrate that? If I go back to section 7.2.5, the supplementary section on integrating powers of trig functions, we know that any time we see an even power of tangent or cotangent, that can be converted to an expression involving an even power of secant or cosecant, respectively. In this case, the identity I want is that cotangent is cosecant squared minus 1, which means I have the antiderivative of cosecant squared, which is negative cotangent, minus integral 1 d theta, which is minus theta. All right, we're not done yet, and this is a crucial part of these problems. We made this auxiliary substitution to get rid of the square root so we could integrate this thing, but now I need to put this back in terms of x. Okay, to put it back in terms of x, just use what you know, which is x equals 3 sine theta, which is the same as sine theta equals x over 3, which led us to this reference triangle, which I need to have in mind when I'm doing this. And then there's one other thing I want to observe. This one also tells me that theta equals sine inverse x over 3. And I do actually have a theta term in my answer, so that theta term will just turn into sine inverse x over 3. All right, what about the cotangent? Well, for that, just go to my reference triangle picture. And I know for this theta, cotangent would be adjacent over opposite. And adjacent over opposite would be this guy divided by x. So I believe that will give us negative adjacent side to theta over opposite from theta minus theta which is sine inverse x over 3 and we're done once we get it back in terms of x that's as far as we need to go alright so as you follow this example and we do a few more here you'll see the procedure is the same every time the only thing that's going to change is the nature of this substitution that I used up here. It's going to depend simply on which one of these three forms we're looking at. So we've looked at an example of how to handle square root a squared minus u squared. Uh, let's go for the square root of u squared minus a squared now, that second one. So again, Let's think about square root u squared minus a squared. And we conjectured before that since that looks similar to what I have in the form u times square root u squared minus a squared in the denominator, the one that goes back to secant inverse when I integrate it, that suggests to me that possibly I need to do a secant substitution here. 
and that is what's going to work, and you'll see why here in a minute. The substitution I want is to let u equal a secant theta. So if it looks like variable stuff squared minus constant stuff squared, the substitution I want is the variable part u equals the constant a times secant theta. Notice, of course, that means that du is equal to a secant theta tangent theta d theta. Okay, let's follow this one and see where it goes. So, of course, if I take my u squared minus a squared and I plug in the substitution, it's going to be square root a squared secant squared theta minus a squared. Assuming a is positive, I'll end up with an a times square root secant squared theta minus 1, which would be a times square root tangent squared theta. Now, the peculiar one of these three is the second substitution, the secant one, and you'll see why here in a second. So, first of all, let's look at our substitution one more time. We said u equals a secant theta. Okay, let's think about the restriction we originally put on secant theta. If you recall, the restriction was 0 to pi over 2, not including pi over 2 because the secant function is undefined there, union pi over 2 to pi, meaning the restriction we put on secant to make it 1 to 1 was quadrant 1, quadrant 2. And what do I get back for an answer when I take the secant of either one of those angles? Well, if it's an angle between 0 and pi over 2, we end up getting something bigger than 1. If it's an angle in quadrant 2, that is something bigger than pi over 2, less than or equal to pi, I actually get something less than negative 1. So what I'm saying there is angles in quadrant 2 get you secant values bigger than 1, and theta values in quadrant 2 get you secant values in quadrant 2. I'm sorry, get you secant values less than negative 1. And that should make sense to you if you think about it. If you're over here, you know that cosine is positive. Secant's the reciprocal of cosine, so secant would be positive. But if you're over here in quadrant 2, you know that at points in quadrant 2, the cosine relates to the x-coordinate, so cosine's negative in quadrant 2. All right, so we're just saying over here what? If u is positive, we're saying theta is in quadrant 1. We're saying if u is negative, theta is in quadrant 2. Okay, this is important, as you'll see here in just a moment. Okay, here's really the big issue. Let's go back to what we have up here on this line. We said that u squared minus a squared ended up being a times the square root of tan squared theta. Okay, but because theta is in quadrant 1 or 2, we have to ask, what do we know about tangent in quadrant 1 and quadrant 2? In quadrant 1, tangent theta is positive, but in quadrant 2, tangent theta is negative. Okay, the thing is, when I take the square root of a positive number, I want that principal square root to also be a positive number. I would really like to be able to say that this is equal to a tan theta, but now looking at this diagram, you can see that there's a problem there. If theta is in quadrant 2, then tangent theta is negative, and this is now a negative number, which is not really what I want when I take the square root of a positive number. Now, generally, what happens when I take the square root of a square and I want to guarantee that the answer is positive, we normally need to take the absolute value of that x to make sure that the square root of that quantity squared really is positive. So what we could say here that would be legitimate is that this equals a times the absolute value of tangent theta. 
Okay, the problem with that is I don't really want to have to integrate things, if I can help it, that contain absolute values. So we're going to fudge, we're going to cheat a little bit here, and we're going to assume, and so make a note of this, we're going to assume when we apply the method of trig substitution to forms u squared minus a squared that u is positive. And you can see that if u is positive, then in this case, u being positive means we're in quadrant one, in which case tangent is positive, which means a tan theta absolute value would just be a tan theta. In other words, we're going to cheat and assume that u is a positive number so that we don't have to contend with that absolute value. Now if you're asking what happens if the u is negative, I'll show you in a minute. But what I'm saying here with this starred item is anytime we're doing a general indefinite integral, so I am talking about for indefinite integrals here, where we're not actually plugging in values for the variable, we're going to assume that u, and of course most of the time it's going to be x, but let's say generally u, is a positive number. In which case we can say that u squared minus a squared will turn into a tan theta under this substitution. Now like I said, I'll show you here in a little bit what would happen if let's say you were working an indefinite integral and u was negative, uh, what, what does that do to this substitution? I'll show you that here in, in a little bit. But for general indefinite integrals, we're going to assume u is positive. So for example, let's look at integral dx over let's say x cubed square root x squared minus 9. Okay again I'm keying off that square root x squared minus 9 that I see in the denominator and I recognize right away that that is a u squared minus a squared form where of course u is just x again and a is 3. Okay, what's the substitution I want? Based on this form, we're saying we want the substitution x equals 3 secant theta, which means dx equals 3 secant theta tangent theta d theta. Uh, notice what I, by what I just said a few minutes ago, that we're going to assume here tacitly that x is positive. Okay, if x is positive, that puts me in quadrant 1. In quadrant 1, what would my reference triangle picture look like? Well, we are saying secant theta equals x over 3. So when I draw the reference triangle where this is theta, uh, secant is what? Hypotenuse over adjacent. So hypotenuse over adjacent. Okay, what does that make that third leg? Square root x squared minus 9, which takes us right back to the same form we started with. All right, from that reference triangle picture, I'll be able to construct anything I need when we finally get to our, our antiderivative answer. Okay, at this point, what do I do? I plug everything in. So let's see, what do we have? We have dx which we said was 3 secant theta tangent theta d theta over x cubed. Now, of course, if x is 3 secant theta, then we'll just cube x and say x cubed is 27 secant cubed theta times square root x squared minus 9. Okay, so let's look at that part. 
Okay, now I'll run through this one more time, although again, if we, if we sort of uh, keep a short list of what these forms resolve to and we use our substitution, we can quickly say what the answer is to this. But if I write down what it looks like, it's going to be 9 secant squared theta minus 9, which is square root 9 times secant squared minus 1, which is square root of 9 times square root secant squared minus 1, which is 3 times the square root of tan squared theta. 3 tan theta is, I know what I'm going to get when I make this substitution, which means that goes right here. Okay, let's clean that up. Um, I do see that these 3's cancel pretty nicely. Looks like what I have left for a constant is a 1 27th. And I see that these tangents also go. So it looks like I have a 1 over secant squared, which would actually be cosine squared. So it looks like I have 1 27th integral cosine squared theta d theta. Um, I know how to integrate even powers of sine and cosine. I have to use those power reduction formulas. I know cosine squared is 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. In other words, we have 1 over 54 integral 1 plus cosine 2 theta. Uh, what does that turn out to be? Uh, 1 54th theta plus 1 54th times the integral of cosine 2 theta, which is 1 half sine of 2 theta. So 1 54th theta, let's say plus 108 sine 2 theta. All right, now it shouldn't be too hard to say what theta is. Because if we go back to our original definition up here, our substitution, let's just remember that saying x equals 3 secant theta is the same thing as saying secant theta equals x over 3. But that's the same thing as saying theta equals secant inverse of x over 3. So on this bottom line, that becomes 1 over 54 times secant inverse x over 3. Now, how do I deal with something like sine 2 theta? Well, I have to be able to reconstruct what that is from my reference triangle picture. And this is where I make an appeal to identities that help me translate different trig functions into simpler trig functions. And of course, the one I'm thinking of there is the one that says sine 2 theta can be expressed simply in terms of regular sine theta and regular cosine theta. So sine 2 theta is 2 times sine theta times cosine theta. So what do I have? 1 54th secant inverse x over 3. Uh, and by the way, that should be a plus right there. Plus 1 54th sine of theta, okay, remember, to get these two, that is sine theta and cosine theta, I simply go back to my reference triangle and reconstruct those. I know that sine of theta would be opposite over hypotenuse, so opposite, which is right here, over hypotenuse, which is x times cosine, which would be adjacent over hypotenuse. Put that together, and I've got 1 54th secant inverse x over 3. Uh, looks like 1 54th times 3, which is 1 18th uh, times, looks like there'll be an x squared to go with that 18, and a square root x squared minus 9 in the top. And once we've gotten rid of all the thetas and gotten it back in terms of x's, we've found our antiderivative.
All right, now, as to the question of, uh, because of this little anomaly about whether x is positive or negative, what happens if x is negative? For example, if we had, let's say, um, a definite integral where the interval of integration contained negative numbers. Okay, I'll, I'll do that example last. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and figure out our third form. So, of course, if you look back at the original list, the third form was square root a squared plus u squared. So now it's a sum under there with those two squares. Well, again, if I sort of compare that to the thing we've seen before, it kind of looks like that. Um, tan inverse was the one that ended up working as the antiderivative. So it makes me think that tangent is the correct substitution here. The substitution I'm going to use is let u equal a tan theta. And if you're thinking ahead to why the other two work, you're already seeing why this one works. If u is equal to tan theta, then this a squared plus u squared becomes a squared plus a squared tan squared which is a times the square root of 1 plus tan squared. 1 plus tan squared is the same thing as secant squared. All right, let's make sure we don't have some sort of unusual situation like we did with secant. Okay, let's look at our definition, where, of course, we're saying tangent theta equals x over a. Okay, what was the restriction on the tangent function that made it one-to-one? -one? Well, if you recall, the restriction on the tangent function is the same as the restriction on the sine function. It's quadrant one or quadrant four. What do I get back for an answer? Well, when you take the tangent of something between negative pi over two and pi over two, and by the way, those should be open interval, not closed. So when you take the tangent of something in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2, what's the range of the tangent function? It's all real numbers. Okay, but whether you end up with a positive answer or a negative answer depends on whether your theta was in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. So again, looking at this guy, if x is positive, then that means tangent theta is positive, which means we're in quadrant 1. If this x is negative, then that means tangent theta is negative, and that means we're in quadrant 4. So again, just like the sine substitution, our two reference triangles would be drawn in quadrants 1 and 4. Theta could be here, theta could be there. All right, now. Let's look at our expression up here. A times the square root of secant squared theta. Okay, remember, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, and we are in quadrant one or we're in quadrant four. What do I know about cosine in both of those quadrants? It's positive, meaning the square root of secant squared is just secant. So under this substitution, we're saying the square root of a squared plus u squared will always turn into a secant theta, regardless of whether u is positive or negative. So the only one that has that little peculiarity with the signs is the secant substitution. The sine substitution for a squared minus u squared and the tangent substitution for a squared plus u squared are both just fine. Uh, notice, of course, that if u equals a tangent theta, du is going to be a secant squared theta d theta. Let's look at an example of this sort of substitution. So again, we're talking about any kind of integral that contains some square root of a squared plus u squared form. So, for example, let's try a really simple looking one, like integral of square root x squared plus 5. 
And for as seemingly simple as it appears, uh, you'll realize after you look at it for a few seconds that we've never integrated that. We don't have any techniques that can handle that. There are simply none that apply. However, that is a straightforward u squared plus a squared under a square root form. Again, u is x. What's a? It's square root of 5. Okay, what's my substitution? I'm going to let x equal a tan theta. What's dx? It's square root of 5 secant squared theta d theta. What does x squared plus 5 become when I apply this substitution? Writing it out, it looks like it's going to be x squared, which would be 5 tan squared theta plus 5. If I factor out the square root of 5, then what's left is a tan squared plus 1. And I know that's just secant squared. But because of the restrictions on my theta in this definition, I know that just ends up being secant theta. In other words, just like we verified on the last page, uh, a, a secant theta. All right, so in this problem, what does that integral become? Well, it becomes square root of x squared plus 5, which is just square root of 5. Actually, let's do this in blue. So square root of 5 secant theta. Again, don't forget, because I, I wouldn't be repeating this if this wasn't something that people do, it's very easy to forget all about the dx. And obviously, the dx is all important. The dx in this case is square root of 5 secant squared theta d theta which means I have a 5 and I have a secant cubed theta d theta. Okay, do we know how to integrate secant cubed? Well, I won't redo that here because we already did that in a previous video. If you go back and check the video for 7.2.5, one of the examples was the integral of odd powers of secant, and the one I did was secant cubed. And odd powers of secant and odd powers of cosecant are the ones that require integration by parts. Um, if you go back and check the example, you'll see that the antiderivative of secant cubed theta would be secant theta tangent theta plus ln absolute value secant theta plus tangent theta all over 2. That's the answer we got when we did the integration by parts. Or in other words, let's just say 5 halves secant theta tangent theta plus 5 halves ln secant theta plus tangent theta. All right, now we haven't drawn the reference triangle picture yet. Um, you can either do that at the beginning of your problem or later on. It doesn't matter when you do it, but I want to see it somewhere. If this is a written problem where you're showing work, I want to see a picture of that reference triangle to see where you're deriving your different ratios from. So in this case, uh, let's draw this in green. Um, we certainly have reference triangles possible in quadrants 1 and 4. It'll be sufficient for you to just draw the basic one in quadrant 1. So of course, up here, we said that tangent theta was x over the square root of 5. That means in my picture, if this is theta, that would be opposite over adjacent. Opposite over adjacent. Which means my third side, the hypotenuse, would be square root of the sum of the squares of the other two sides. And there again, look what we end up with. It's that same original form that we started out with in the problem, that we did this substitution to get around. All right, from that reference triangle, we should be able to fill in everything in this answer. So we just do it one piece at a time. 
secant theta from that reference triangle picture would be hypotenuse over adjacent times tangent, so I'm right here, which from my reference triangle picture over here would be opposite over adjacent, plus 5 halves ln of those same two things. So square root x squared plus 5 over square root of 5. And actually, since we're going to add those two and they have a common denominator, let's just put them all over one common denominator of square root of 5. Okay, anything we can clean up there? Uh, well, those two make a 5, and that will cancel out with that 5 which means I'd be left with one half, or if you like, let's call it x times square root x squared plus 5 over 2. That would be this part. Anything nice in the second part over here? Um, it's okay if you leave it like that. I will point out to you that... Um, I could certainly write this part, and I suspect this is probably how they would write something like this in the back of the book. I can certainly write that as 5 halves times the ln absolute value square root x squared plus 5 plus x um, minus ln squared of 5. And you notice what they're doing there. They're writing the ln of that quotient as the difference of the two logs. Uh, the reason I think they would probably do that, if you'll notice, when you multiply this times this, that becomes a constant. That constant could be absorbed into your additive integration constant, which means you could write your final answer as x square root x squared plus 5 over 2 plus 5 halves times ln absolute value square root x squared plus 5 plus x plus c, where the combination of the 5 halves and this term just gets absorbed into that additive integration constant. This form of the answer is fine. As usual, I'm just saying that if you're trying to match this up with what you see in the back of the book, they are probably going to try and remove as much as they can, and if it means exploiting a log property to do that, you may see them simplify something like this in this way. Okay, let's look at one more example. Uh, this time let's do a definite integral. Let's do the integral negative 8 to negative 4 dx over x squared minus 4 to the 3 halves. Now, there's a couple of things you should be noticing. Um, number one, uh, first question, of course, is which one of the three methods applies? Um, I do see x squared minus 4, so that does make me think about u squared minus a squared. And since that is sitting inside a 3 halves, or is raised to a 3 halves power, it does look like I have a square root of u squared minus a squared raised to the third power, meaning that square root of u squared minus a squared form is there, buried in that 3 halves power. Okay, meaning the substitution that makes sense based on our previous examples would be to let u equal a secant theta. Of course, in this case, that really means letting x equal 2 secant theta, which of course is going to ultimately mean dx is equal to 2 secant theta tangent theta d theta. Okay, now a couple other things to notice. Of course, if we're saying x equals 2 secant theta, then we're saying secant theta equals x over 2. 
Okay, what do we know about the secant theta function? We know that the restriction we make on it is from 0 to pi over 2 union pi over 2 to pi. That is, we restrict the secant function to quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. And when we do, what do we get back for secant ratios? Well, if we take an angle from quadrant 1 and plug it into the secant function, we get something bigger than 1. If we take something from quadrant 2, plug it into the secant function, we get something less than negative 1. Okay, now, this is a dx integral. Where are all of our x's? Well, they're all taken from the interval negative 8 to negative 4, an interval on which all x values are negative. Okay, notice then from our equation secant theta equals x over 2, if x is negative, that means secant theta is negative. Okay, where does secant take its argument from either quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. In quadrant 1, secant is positive, and quadrant 2, secant is negative. So putting all that together, we know that since all of these x values are negative, secant theta will be negative, which means theta has to be in quadrant 2. Okay, that means when I draw my reference angle picture from this statement, I should be drawing the reference angle picture. I think I can draw a little bit straighter than that. I should be drawing my reference angle picture in quadrant 2. And of course, when I say secant theta equals x over 2, um, we know that that ratio is negative. And really, since I'm thinking of secant theta, where this is the reference angle for theta, as being adjacent over hypotenuse, I'm sort of thinking of this as being, I'm sorry, hypotenuse over adjacent. Then I'm thinking of this as being the x and this as being the 2. Well, really, I know picture-wise it's the 2 that's negative, if that's an x-coordinate that gets me out to this point in quadrant 3. So it's this ratio that's negative. And when I draw the picture this way, it's going to be convenient to think of the 2 as the negative part, and I'll just draw the x up here as the hypotenuse. More to the point, what is this vertical third leg of the triangle, or third side of the triangle? It should be the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus the other side squared. And there's that same x squared minus 4 square root that was really buried in our integrand to start with, and it's the reason we did this substitution. Okay, there's our working triangle for this substitution. Now, we're at the point where I think we can take our substitution and let's try and rewrite our integral. Now, what I'm going to do here in the beginning is forget about the limits just for a minute, and I'm just going to worry about rewriting that dx over x squared minus 4 to the 3 halves, which of course looks like that. We know dx is going to be 2 secant theta tangent theta d theta. Down here, I know square root of x squared minus 4 is going to be the square root of 4 secant squared theta minus 4. There will be a cube around that. So, of course, that gives me 2 secant theta tangent theta in the top with a d theta. Um, in the bottom, I know that when I take that square root, that 4 comes out as a 2. What's left under the square root is a secant squared minus 1 which is a tangent squared. And then there's a cube around all of that. All right, now we're back to the problem we had a little while ago, which is what's the square root of tangent squared? Well, it does depend on what quadrant you're in, right? Now, what we said was for the secant substitution, it was the one peculiar substitution of the three, and that this is the one where we had to fudge a little bit and we said that when we were doing indefinite integrals, we would assume our x variable is, variable is positive. Clearly, that is not the case here. These x values are all negative. That means I cannot make this assumption anymore. 
That's why I'm showing you this example. I won't have to worry about this sort of thing with the sine substitution and the tangent substitution. So this goes back to the question I asked several minutes ago, which is what happens in the secant substitution in a definite integral if your x values are actually negative? Well, that's easy. If your x values are negative, we said that means your secant value is negative. If your secant is negative, you're in quadrant two. Okay, what is tangent of an angle in quadrant two? It's negative. So if I'm taking the square root of something that's negative squared, what do I need to do to make sure that I get a positive answer? I need to negate that negative number to make sure I'm getting something positive. In other words, we know the tan squared theta, when I take the square root, is just regular tan theta if theta is between 0 and pi over 2, but it's negative tan theta if theta is in quadrant 2. And for this substitution, our theta is in quadrant 2 because our integration interval is a set of negative numbers. Okay, meaning when you do the x equals a secant theta, and this is the part you might want to pay attention to especially, if I'm doing my x equals a secant theta substitution, then at the point where you get to the square root of tan squared, if you know that theta is in quadrant 1, then square to tangent squared theta just becomes tan theta. But if you know your theta is in quadrant 2, which is going to be the case if your definite integral is being done over an interval of negative numbers, then the square root of tan squared theta is actually negative tan theta. Okay, what that means for our problem, if I erase some of this, is that at this line right here, I have two secant theta, tangent theta, d theta, over, uh, looks like two cubed, which is eight, but when I take the square root of tan squared theta, I'm going to get negative tan theta. And of course, I'm going to cube that theta, and there'll be a negative in front of all that. Which means when I clean that up, there's going to be a negative one-eighths in front of everything. With, it looks like, a secant left up top and two tangents left down bottom. And that should be theta. All right, so we've got ourselves around the tricky part here, which is what happens when I get to that square root tan theta. Now, again, remember what I'm telling you. If you're doing this definite integration with one of the other two substitutions, you don't have to think about the sign of that thing that's being squared under the square root. If you have a square root of a cosine squared, it just becomes square root of cosine. All right, now in this case, what do I have? I have the integral negative 1 8 uh, secant theta, d theta over tan squared theta. And we'll worry about the limits here in a minute. We'll just get our antiderivative now in terms of theta. All right, so, you know, if it was a product of a secant and a tangent, we talked about back in 7.2.5 how to deal with those. This time it's a quotient. And what's the rule of thumb when those things are on opposite sides of the fraction bar? Well, the first thing you should think about doing is resolving those into sines and cosines so you can see what you're actually working with there. So if I think about secant over tangent, I know secant really puts a cosine in the bottom, and I know 1 over tan squared is the same as cotan squared, which would be cosine squared over sine squared. And I can see now that that's actually just a cosine over a sine squared. And if there's a du in front of that, or a d theta in front of that, uh, that looks to me like a du over u squared, if u is equal to sine theta. 
So let's take that on to the next page. So we're saying we have the integral negative one eighth integral cosine theta d theta over sine squared theta. And I'm saying that looks like a minus one eighth u to the negative two du. That's if u is sine theta, which gives me negative one eighth times the antiderivative of u to the negative two with respect to u which would be u to the negative 1 over negative 1. Um, I think that's going to be 1 over 8u, which in this case would be 1 over 8 sine theta. And that is the antiderivative of our original function in terms of theta after I made my x equals 2 secant theta substitution. So, what do I do now to finish off evaluating this definite integral? Well, there's one of two ways to go. I have 1 over 8 sine theta, and I could evaluate that at whatever theta values I would get when x equals negative 4 and x equals negative 8. So what we're saying is we could figure out what is theta when x equals negative 4 and what is theta when x equals negative 8 sorry what is theta when x equals negative 8 I said it right just wrote something weird there and we could put those values in here and then evaluate this in terms of theta what's the other way we could do it uh, we could change this theta back into x and then we could just use the values of negative 4 and negative 8 here well, since I've already got this antiderivative in terms of theta, I think it's actually going to be a little bit easier to just figure out what these values are in terms of theta and then just evaluate at those theta values. All right, so let's go back to the fact that secant of theta is equal to x over 2, which of course means theta is secant inverse of x over 2. So that means I should be able to say when x is negative 4 that theta is secant inverse of negative 4 over 2, which would be secant inverse of negative 2. On the other hand, when x is negative 8, I should be able to say that theta is secant inverse of negative 8 over 2, which is secant inverse of negative 4. Okay, what that means is these two values, the upper and lower limit, the upper limit in terms of theta would be secant inverse of negative 2, that's this one, and the lower limit should be secant inverse of negative 4, and that was the other one. And I think this is about as straightforward as it's going to get. Okay, how do I evaluate that? Well, I'll just write it out. It's 1 eighth. Now, by the way, we might as well call 1 over sine cosecant. So this would be cosecant evaluated at the upper limit minus cosecant evaluated at the lower limit. Now, how do I figure out combinations like these? Well, this is what you did back in section 6.8. And all I really need and all I really want to see when you work one of these out for me and show the work is a reference triangle picture. And let's see, we already had a general reference triangle picture done up right here. Uh, let's, let's practice doing that one more time, but let's do it with the numbers here. So, for example... We know that first angle, this one, was, let's call it theta equals secant inverse of negative 2, which of course is the same thing as saying secant theta equals negative 2. Of course, I could call that negative 2 over 1. Now when I draw that, of course, 
if this is the reference triangle and it's in quadrant two, I know again that if this is theta and this is the reference angle for that, secant should be, well, it's reciprocal of cosine, so it should be hypotenuse over adjacent. So it should be hypotenuse over adjacent. And again, I'm just putting the negative in the place where it makes sense, which is on the x-coordinate. What is the other leg of that triangle? Well, it should be square root of 2 squared minus negative 1 squared. It should be square root of 3. Okay, if that's what theta is, then the only question is, what is the cosecant of that theta? Well, from this picture of the reference triangle, I know cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite. Hypotenuse over opposite would be 2 over square root of 3. That's what this guy is. Minus, okay, let's do it again. And we can just repeat this for emphasis. Let's do it all again. I'll erase all that so we're not looking at that. Look at this part here. We're trying to get a handle on what the reference triangle looks like for the angle theta equals secant inverse of negative 4. Of course, that's the same thing as saying secant theta equals negative 4 over 1 or 4 over negative 1. And since the secant value is negative, that means we're in quadrant 2. So there's my theta, there's the reference angle. And since secant for that angle is adjacent over hypotenuse, there's the adjacent, there's the hypotenuse. I know the third side by Pythagorean should be 16 minus 1, so it should be square root of 15. Okay, so there's the theta, which is this guy right here. What is the cosecant of that angle? Well, again, from the reference triangle picture, the cosecant of that angle would be the ratio of the hypotenuse to the side opposite, which would be 4 over square root of 15. All right, there is our answer. And if you check that, uh, the number I came up with when I punched this into the calculator was about 0 0.015, which is positive. Okay, here's the question. Does it make sense to have a positive answer? Well, let's look at the graph of this function for a minute. Um, if I zoom out, you can see, well, I'd have to zoom out further for you to really see it. But you should realize from looking at this function that there is a vertical asymptote at negative 2, and there's another one at 2. I know that because if x squared minus 4 is sitting under a square root, to have numbers in a proper domain, I'd have to have x squared minus 4 greater than or equal to 0. Uh, that means either x is bigger than 2 or x is less than or equal to negative 2. Okay, which means approaching 2 from the right in your picture, there's a vertical asymptote and approaching negative 2 from the left, there's a vertical asymptote. All right, what's the integral we were doing? We were doing the integral from negative 8 to negative 4 of this function. Okay, notice in the picture that on the interval negative 8 to negative 4, which is an increasing interval, our function is positive. That means if I integrate from negative 8 to 4 and I integrate a positive function, I had better get a positive answer because the interpretation is clearly area under that positive curve. Okay, the answer we got was positive. And you all see here that the real upshot of this example, and this is the main takeaway, is that at the point where we had tan squared theta, if we had not put a negative in front of the tangent, the answer that we just got would have been negative 0.015, which would have been incorrect. This is why the adjustment was necessary. So just to make an easy rule for you, I'll summarize in this way. Let's just say that for definite intervals,
when you contain or when you have an integral that has a form of a squared minus u squared, you know that your substitution that you do, which is x equals a sine theta, is eventually at some point going to lead to a cosine squared theta under square root. Under all conditions, that may always be resolved into cosine theta, and you don't have to worry about whether x is positive or negative. And we talked about y before when we went over that substitution. If you have an a squared plus u squared under square root, we know the proper substitution is x equals a tangent theta. When you run that substitution, you are going to end up with a secant squared theta. The third one we did was the u squared minus a squared. And again, we know the proper substitution for that one is x equals a secant theta. We know that eventually, when that's simplified, we're going to end up with a tan squared theta under the square root. All right, the first two automatically get resolved into cosine and secant, and we don't have to think at all about whether x is positive or negative. It's this last one that's the problem. And the summary now for this last case is, number one, for indefinite integrals, we will simply assume x is positive, in which case, when you get to the square root of tan squared theta, it will be tan theta. For definite integrals, there will be one of two cases. Your, let's say case number one, your interval of integration will contain all positive numbers. If that's the case, then when you get to that square root of tan squared, it just becomes tan theta. Case two, though, if your interval of integration contains all negative numbers, then when you get to the point where you're getting ready to simplify tan squared theta, it needs to be simplified to negative tan theta. Okay, notice for this particular integrand, this u squared minus a squared, your interval of integration for, an in, for a definite integral will always be all positive numbers or all negative numbers. Think about that if that's under a square root, you know that only makes sense if that's positive or non-negative, but that means u squared has to be greater than or equal to a squared. If a is positive, that means u is greater than or equal to a, or it means u is less than or equal to negative a, meaning if that's a and that's negative a, your interval of integration has to either be contained in the interval a to infinity, or it has to be contained in the interval negative infinity to negative a. You can't have an interval of integration that somehow contains some of this and some of this. This function is not defined anywhere in between negative a and a. So there's no way for this integral to make sense if the interval of integration contains some negative stuff and some positive stuff. Okay, so other than that very peculiar case, everything else is straightforward. And the main thing you want to focus on is the technique. The technique is the same for all three. It's just three different little substitution equations. But once you make the substitution, the process is the same in all cases. Make your substitution, simplify your integrand in terms of theta, integrate that function, which is going to be usually some combination of trig functions, once you've found your antiderivative, use your reference triangle 
to substitute x's back in and get your antiderivative answer in terms of x. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Let me know if you have any questions over this.